welcome to Creative Cow. Today we speak with Ricardo Lupi, a professional color grader who has taken some time to look at Nob Omniscope and let us know what he thinks. Hello, Ricardo. How are you? Hello, Bree. Thank you for having me. Uh, all good. Thank you. All good. Now, just to start, Ricardo, can you just tell us a little bit about your background in color grading? For sure. So I run a remote post-production studio called Metata Post, and I focus on color grading and retouching as the main outline, but I also do editing because that's my background. I actually started out as an editor. Then I transitioned to color grading, I would say about four years ago, something like that. I, I always did some, some color processing as I was editing, as soon as I got you know, into flat footage flat quote unquote of course talking about any sort of log um, the first footage was GoPro so effectively that's flat more than log but whatever uh, but yes so about four years ago I transitioned into color grading and then other retouching as well because I feel like these two are very linked together and now I do all three just because I feel like being an all-rounder uh, given that I work mostly with small and medium productions is the best course of action for these productions just to have one person that can handle everything but in that sense you know um, no omniscope what we're going to talk about today can really help in all these aspects and that's a very interesting thing because people relate usually scopes with color grading but the way no omniscope is built can be very useful also for for example editing and again we're going to talk about that uh, later on i believe and maybe you can just cover what is the utility of scopes in color grading sure so depending on where you stand with color grading you might see scopes as a guideline or a safety feature for me it's more of a safety feature in the sense that i would usually grade by my eye by what i feel like works i feel like is aesthetic and along the way i'll use the scope to double check that i'm not messing it up this is mostly because, especially as we do long sessions, the brain gets used to looking at the same type of look, if you will. So if you're doing something that is very warm, your brain will get used to the warmth and see less and less than that. So you might be overdoing it over time. If you have scopes available for you, you can always check, okay, my color temperature is sort of there, my balance is sort of there, and I know that that's the ballpark where I wanna keep it, right? Uh, some other people might use it as a guideline where they're going to grade more with the scopes than their eye. I feel like that's something that is not that effective, mostly because you tend to be too technical and you tend to disregard the aesthetic aspect of color grading. Uh, but nevertheless, it is a very good indication if you want, if you, for example, are just starting out and you don't have professionally calibrated monitors. And that's true for basically any, um, any colorist that is just starting out and doesn't have let's say five grand to spend on monitors and having scopes can help you making sure that, okay, maybe my screen is a bit uh, green tinted, but then I can look at my vector scope and I know, okay, my scopes are fine. So I know that maybe this looks a bit green on my end, but it's just because of my monitor, the effective skin tone maybe of the talent is still correct. And what did you notice were the advantages of Nob Omniscope, despite the fact that DaVinci does already have scopes built in? So um, one of the first advantages that really interested me was the possibility to use it not only in DaVinci. This is because I also do uh, photo photography work. I also do photography, color grading and retouching. And you don't have scopes in Lightroom or Photoshop. And I always felt like, okay, I'm missing something without them, um, which led me at one point into color grading big stills in DaVinci Resolve. I still do at times, but having Nob, you know, uh, having the ability to just have the scopes in any program I'm using for video and photo editing is really an important feature for me. The other major thing is the possibility to customize the scopes. DaVinci is a bit limited. 
for example, you can have just one waveform at a time. Uh, now with the nine uh, scopes up, it's a bit different. You can have a bit more, uh, but you need to have a dedicated screen to scopes. I mean, I, I do at this point, but uh, back then I didn't really have uh, one dedicated monitor, or at least I had to sacrifice a bit if I wanted to have the nine up from DaVinci. Having the possibility to customize the scopes and have, for example, as I was saying, two waveforms at the same time, uh, that allows me to have one waveform that is maybe just looking at the luminosity and one other that is looking at the luminosity but is colorized or is looking at the RGB. The same thing would be, for example, with Vectorscope. Vectorscope in DaVinci, you can again now choose to split it into um, the different ranges. So just look at the, the highlights, the midterms or the, um, the shadows. But once again, you can't see all three at once in terms of like having three vector scope available for you, unless you sacrifice some something else, because again, you can have a maximum of nine in DaVinci, you can't have more than nine. And so if you want to be able to have one vector, one full vector scope, and then three different ones, one for highlights, mid tone and shadows, you can't do that in DaVinci. Then there are a lot of nuances, honestly, um, in terms of like, as I mentioned initially, you know, there are a few things for editors that might be interesting, which is, for example, um, blanking detection. So when you're editing, especially nowadays with social medias where you need to edit vertically, um, if everything is shot horizontally, you're gonna need to do a lot of reframing. But as you reframe, uh, the chance that you get maybe just one line of pixels that is black at any of the edges is pretty high. And before using Omniscope, I had a few gimmicks in place to, to check for that. Maybe just uh, you know solid background, a solid green background below everything, so that if I move something out, I'll see the, this green line popping on screen. But it's not reliable um, because depending on how you layer stuff in the Vinci, you might not see that. No Omniscope has a function where if you do get blanking, it will literally uh, tell you via text, "Hey, there's." In this frame, there's blanking. So it's like at, at a glance, uh, at a glimpse of an eye, you know that you're messing up there. That can, you know, make it or break it with a client. Because if you present something that has a black line of pixels and you didn't QC correctly, um, the client's going to be mad at you, of course. So a lot of nuances, but I would say the, the key points for me were these ones. And what factors do you feel play into uh, the stability of Nob Omniscope? That's one other thing, you know, with uh, being a Blackmagic user, at least on the software end, I'm used to unstable versions. Blackmagic uh, has unfortunately an history of releasing versions that are not really stable. That's the reason, for example, why I don't usually update to the latest version of DaVinci. I'm working one or two versions in the past, uh, just because I know, okay, that's, that's tested, you know, that I know people that have already used it. Uh, Blackmagic, no one is really complaining too much, so I'm fine with it. And... So, you know, every time I had to go into a new software, I'm very sketchy because I'm, I'm implementing it into my workflow. And for me, efficiency in every, is everything. I want to make sure that the tools I'm working with are reliable. And with no Omniscope, uh, what I was really pleased to see is that they do so many iterations. For example, this new version, version 10, is being presented to the public just a few days ago, right? But if you look at the log page from version 10, where it gives you all the details of, you know, every single release of version 10, at this point, I believe that we are at version 78. I'm not sure again, it might be already at 79 uh, at this point, because, you know, I've, just to give an example, I downloaded version 77, 10.77. And as soon as I opened it, uh, it told me, hey, there's version 10.78. Uh, you want to update? Of course. So version 10 at this point has been around for about eight months. Uh, the first release of version 10, I believe, was in February. So yeah, about 10 months. It has been tested a lot. And the different features that we see as new features, right, have been implemented through time. It was not like, okay, these are all the features that we want to put in. There you go. There has been a lot of testing, uh, you know, before that. And this definitely plays into getting a software at this point to the public that is really stable and reliable. And as an indie colorist yourself, what features did you find the most appealing in the latest version? The main features that 
I really like were the ones related to automations and so workflow efficiency and QC. So, you know, everything that relies to, with quality control. In particular, for quality control, there's this new QC timeline. When doing QC, now with Omniscope, you can open this tool that is called QC timeline and you can simply pl play the footage through and they will visualize a timeline with basically different layers for all the different QC parameters that you can have in there and you can customize it to whatever parameters to apply for you. For example, there's all the QC parameters for HDR. If you're delivering SDR, you don't really care about that so you can take it out, but of course it's available for you if you need to. But what happens is that visually, it gives you an indication of what is going on. So if everything is green, everything is safe, then once it plays through, you're good to go. QC passed, you can set it out. But if something happens, you'll get not notifications in the point of the timeline where the issue is. So it's very easy to then understand what's going on, where it's going on, because like, again, when doing QC, it's important to be able to understand where the issue is. You know, again, we're talking about a scope, but for example, a new feature is sound silence detection. So if there's a piece in the timeline, a part in the timeline that is completely silent, no will tell you about that as well. So you can do QC not only for strictly for color grading, but as I mentioned, you know, with blanking detection, with this sound feature, you can do it for editing as well, which is fantastic. Now, in terms of like the, the little nuances, there's a lot to it again that comes into automate the plays into automation. For example, the fact that now when you open up Nob from DaVinci, so in the way basically DaVinci and Nob interact to each other, you have a plugin that you load into DaVinci uh, in the coded page. And now you can launch Nob Omniscope directly from that OFX in DaVinci. And when you do so, it connects automatically to DaVinci before. What you had to do before was open Nob Omniscope and then manually connect it to DaVinci after you have placed the OFX there. So it, it's a minor thing, of course, because it doesn't take you more than a few seconds. But over and over in time, you know, that's an automation that saves you time. Same thing for the input presets. So now there's a lot more uh, about color management in, directly into no Omniscope. You have different presets for SDR, HDR, P3, depending on, on on what your target is, so that you can be sure that no Omniscope is aware of what you're sending it, uh, to it, right? Same thing for the automatic profile detection, meaning that once you send something to Nob, yes, it has its presets and you can set it to whatever you want, but automatically it will detect what you're sending it to. So it will set itself automatically, saving you time. Um, again, a lot of different small things in terms of like ease of use. Uh, one very simple thing that I added, but I feel like is very powerful, is the possibility to play at half the, the frame rate for higher frame rates. So if you have a source video that is at 50 or 60, you can have it, you can have no playing it back at 30 in real time. And that of course saves power because one thing to keep in mind is that Nob is taking power from your system, it's taking power from your GPU, it's taking power from your CPU. If you're, have, if you're working on a very powerful machine, that's not gonna be a problem. But again, if I'm thinking of you know small to medium sized product, um, studios or independent colorists, they might not have that powerful of a machine. Being able to customize it also to run efficiently on your machine really plays a big role um, into how no Omniscope can help you by also not being a burden to your system. Because that's very important. There are a lot of plugins, a lot of tools that are awesome, but they're very difficult to run. So you can't run it all the time. And maybe if you run them, you can't really do everything that you want into DaVinci because you need to you know, step back a bit there. Uh, with Nob is incredibly efficient. So I've never seen it really compromising my system in any possible way. Well, that is a very interesting delve into Nob Omniscope's latest version. Uh, to our cow viewers, don't forget to check out Ricardo's channel, Mad Hatter Color, and that's over on YouTube. Uh, and thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you, Bree. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure.